Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comps. Today it's hard for many to imagine a world where access to almost instantaneous communication just about anywhere one travels did not exist. Well, this was the world I grew up in. And good news, we all survived well enough to create the first generation of those who never knew life without cellular phones. What we have here today are two examples of purpose-built consumer electronics from the early 1980s marketed as an RF-based lifeline to allow one to summon assistance in an emergency. This is like today relying on 146.52 Wilderness Protocol. So it's a bit like placing a message in a bottle and casting it into the sea in hopes our message will be found by someone who either can come to our aid or summon assistance on our behalf. These devices in front of you are 40 channel Class D CB radios using amplitude modulation on 27 megahertz spectrum packed into little cases like an in case of emergency break glass arrangement. However, they could still be effectively used as CB radios if the end user desired to do so. Now you may think the idea of relying on CB as a lifeline is silly, but we have to consider the time we are in. The CB craze was still with us, the FCC dropped the licensing requirement, and millions of individuals had a CB radio in their vehicle and used them regularly. CB radios were often standard equipment in law enforcement vehicles, and in some communities, CB Channel 9 was monitored by the public safety answering points of the time. There were also volunteer organizations like REACT that also monitored Channel 9. So if we look at it through the lens of society today, it does seem silly, but at the time it presented the end user an option to call for assistance or establish a point-to-point -point talk path with family and friends. And now that we know the backstory, let's talk about the devices, test the devices and their accessories, and then see just what level of talk path performance we could expect from the use of these devices. This is going to be a lot of fun, so let's get started. Now both of these devices were manufactured by a company called Craco, which manufactured consumer electronics at the time, and they're out of Compton, California. Both of the radios were assembled in Korea. This is the Mayday 1 on the left, and this is the Mayday 2 on the right. The main differences between these two models of radio are in the controls, whereas this one features the high-low power switch and a display, and this one doesn't have that, but also the fact that this can be self-powered by some AA batteries, making a truly portable option, whereas this needs to be tethered to a 12-volt battery pack. They both come with lighter plugs, and they both come with magnetic mounts here, and the mag mounts interface with the radios with this RCA jack. The antenna whips included artist standard arrangement 27 megahertz rubber duck antennas and you can see here that it uses an MX thread which is nice. The Mate A2 also came with this faux leather case which so many electronics of this period were produced and provided with just such an accessory. Here's our Mate A1 on the bench. It's a good design for its intended market of non-radio end users as its telephone handset shape makes it intuitive to use and allows the user to get the speaker close to their ear in a high noise environment and then the microphone is still in a position of function. Control wise, it doesn't get much more simple than this. You've got a push to talk bar here. You have a channel selector with channel nine clearly marked. You have a volume control which also functions as a power switch. And then you have a squelch control, and that's it. So it's very Spartan, but again, for its intended market, this is an excellent design. Now at the base of it here, we can see we have a coax power plug, and that power plug is polarized, center positive. The RF connection to hook the included mag mount antenna to this radio is an RCA jack. At the top, you can see we have a threaded connection where we can actually attach the antenna to the top of the radio as well. And I mentioned it was an MX thread, but haha, -ha, jokes on me. It's actually a short shank Repco thread, which is the same thing that Bendix King used in their EPH radios. And on the back side, we have venting and we have our data plate, our screws that hold the device together, and then we have a small plastic disc that interfaces with the microphone bracket, which you can remove with a screw if you would like to do so. And again, there is no provision to power this device internally. It has to be powered with the DC plug. Well, let's do some testing here. 
we'll go ahead and hook up our antenna first to my service monitor and then we're going to use the factory provided power plug because we want to use as many of the original doodads as we can and let's go ahead and turn our device on and we're receiving our signal on channel 9 it's our squelch right there so that's good let's go ahead and do a transmit test here is our Mayday 1 transmitting unmodulated we are exhibiting 250 hertz of frequency error, which is almost double the modern five parts per million spec, if my math is correct. And our measured RF carrier is 3.2 watts. Now we have applied audio from the one kilohertz output of my Synadder through a small speaker placed next to the microphone. This is modulating our signal through the Mayday 1's internal microphone. We have an RF signal of 4.2 watts at 84% AM. The signal when viewed through the oscilloscope appears to be undermodulated, however. Let's do some receiver performance testing. We have the Mayday 1 on the bench. I'm powering it with a alkaline battery pack, and I'm using my Tiny SA Ultra as a signal source. We're currently generating a signal at minus 120 decibel milliwatts with a 1 kilohertz tone, and you can see that we're not hearing anything at all at minus 120. So let's go ahead and bring up our signal. 110, you can just barely perceive our audio. And that's minus 100, we're good. About the lowest level I'm able to hear a signal in this device is minus 112 decibel milliwatts. Now here's our Mayday 2 on the bench. I have removed the faux leather case so we can look at the device more clearly. It's a bit different form factor, however, it's still designed to be used close to the ear, which is a good thing. Still we're presented with extremely simple controls. We do have a channel indicator here, which is nice because now you can see it at night. We have our channel selector control here, and again, channel 9 is clearly marked. We have a volume and on-off control here. We have a receiving range control here, and I'm not quite sure if that's an RF gain or a squelch attenuator. We're going to have to determine that. And we have a high and low power switch to control our RF power output and our microphone. On this side of the device here, we have our speaker and, again, a push-to-talk bar. On the opposite side, we have a battery compartment and a vent, and it's pretty obvious this radio has never had batteries installed in it, as you can see here. And we have slots in here for nine batteries. Now, there is an included dummy cell when you're using alkaline batteries, and you would place it in here in one of these other slots to maintain 12 volts. Now, the device also features internal charging, so you could put some old-school NICADs in here, and if you did do so, you would not need the dummy battery. Now at the bottom, you can see our data plate, you can see our antenna connection, our power port, and this is to plug in our cigarette lighter plug to charge the batteries if we had NICADs inside of it. And at the top, we have our antenna connection here if we desire to attach the antenna whip to the radio. And on the back, we have nothing significant to see except for the housing seam. Now that we've connected our device to power and the antenna, let's turn it on. And we're receiving. Let's check the function of this control here. Yep, that's not an RF gain control. That's a squelch attenuator just marked as a receiving range, which to me would indicate it is a RF gain control, but I didn't work for Craco, so there we are. And you can see that our display displays our channels just like it's intended to. Let's go ahead and do some transmitter checks. When transmitting, our Mayday 2 exhibits 75 hertz of frequency error, which is not bad, and is generating a carrier of 3 watts.
Under modulation, our Mate A2 is producing a 4.2 watt RF signal at 82% AM, and the signal looks much better on the oscilloscope than our Mate A1s. Now let's repeat the test with the Craco Mate A2. And spoiler alert, this radio receives much better than the Mate A1 does. As a matter of fact, this is at a level of minus 125 decibel milliwatts. And you can hear the receive is fine with that. Now let's go ahead and add 10 more dB of attenuation. And that brings us to the level that I can perceive with my ear that the Mayday 1 had at minus 112 decibel milliwatts. So definitely a much better performing receiver in this particular example. Considering how poorly the Mayday 1 in our receive testing, I decided to go in here and tweak our receiver a little bit. And the Mayday 2 is still has a much more sensitive receiver. Right now, this is basically at minus 110 decibel milliwatts. We're looking at 10 dB of Cyanide. Now we are going to test the antenna mounts and antennas provided with the Mayday 1 and the Mayday 2. This first image is a sweep of my type N male to RCA female adapter, and we can see it as a tenth of a dB of loss. So when we sweep the mounts, we're going to go ahead and subtract 10 from our measurements. Both of the included mag mounts for the antenna WEPs have 10 feet of RG174 size coax feeding them. The Mayday 1 mount exhibits 0.5 dB of loss, correcting for our adapter. The Mayday 2's mount exhibits 0.67 dB of loss after correcting for our adapter. The Mayday 1's antenna on the mount displays an SWR of 1.43 to 1 at 27.170 MHz, and the Mayday 2's antenna on the mount displays an SWR of 1.29 to 1 at 26.967 MHz. One thing about these radios is they definitely do not have a noise blanker. This is the air conditioning fan in this particular vehicle. And fan off. Now let's do some field strength testing with the equipment as provided. The radio we're going to use is the Mayday 1 and we're going to use the provided whip with the mag mount and you can see it configured here and we're providing power to the device through a lithium ion battery and we're going to be measuring field strength with the zap checker. Our second test is going to be with me standing outside the vehicle with the whip connected to the radio itself. Now for our third and final test, I'll be standing outside the vehicle with the whip attached to the radio. And in this test here, I've made a slight modification. I've taken the center pin out of an RCA jack and I've attached a quarter wavelength radial to the body of the RCA jack. Well, that was interesting. The data we gathered started with the operator sitting inside the vehicle operating the radio with the provided mag mount, and then we observed the field strength, and that's the control in this experiment. In the next instance, we stepped outside the vehicle and attached the whip directly to the radio itself, and we saw a reduction in our field strength, although we no longer had to contend with our earlier observed greater than half a dB loss in the cable and mount. And this is a shortcoming in low band portable radios. It is that our whip only has a limited chassis to work against, and it's far shorter than the quarter wavelength that it needs to be truly efficient. And simply coupling with the operator's body isn't going to help that much either. I made a video several years ago and clearly demonstrated that adding this missing element to a radio at VHF and lower frequencies provided a substantial increase in performance. And that was what I did in this experiment. I soldered 9 foot of hookup wire to an RCA plug with a center pin removed, and this missing element tied to the chassis, coupled with the elimination of the loss in our cable and mount, provided our observed increase in field strength. And in an off-camera experiment, operating the radio with just a whip in the confines of the vehicle didn't cause our meter to deflect at all. 
Now we are going to test just how far away these two emergency CBs can maintain an effective talk path in this environment with the original equipment as provided by the manufacturer. For this test, we have a fixed location, FX1, that is our monitoring site where the recording is taking place. It is equipped with an SBE Sidebander 4 CB radio and the field expedient jungle antenna at 20 foot of feed point elevation that we built in a previous video. Vehicle 1 is equipped with the Mayday 1 and is stationary and staged 100 yards from FX1. Vehicle 2 is equipped with the Mayday 2 and will move along a known line of sight distance route performing radio checks at one half mile intervals. The test will conclude upon loss of signal between vehicle stations. The test was performed at 12 p.m. local time under clear skies and the area is a rural area with moderate tree cover. Let's get started. Radio check, 54321. Well, that was fun and we saw that between two to three miles in this environment is a limit two vehicles equipped with these emergency CBs with provided equipment can expect to communicate. Our fixed location could reach out and communicate four to five miles to our emergency CB equipped mobile stations. Both of these radios operating AM and lacking any form of noise blanking capability whatsoever demonstrated just how much electrical noise emanates from power lines and really makes one appreciate FM. So how useful would one of these emergency CBs have been in their heyday? Well, if you're a mile or so from a highway, you could hail another CB equipped vehicle easily if one required assistance as back then people were more willing to assist strangers. And it would have worked well in a convoy or any other situation where you could envision the use of a two-way radio. So considering the fact that unlicensed consumer two-way radio equipment options were so limited during this time, it's easy to see why many consumer electronics manufacturers churn these out. Are they useful today? As an inexpensive license-free option, they are just as serviceable today as they were back then. Although sad to say, today using one to call for assistance may get you more than you bargained for if anyone is even listening. One thing that is not subject to change over time is the usefulness of a radio is dictated by who is on the other end of that talk path. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.